Hello and welcome to Yolanda Nova, Do You See What I See? In the wake of the recent midterm elections, we have a very special guest, Henry Cisneros. He is a community builder, statesman, and author. He was one of the second uh, mayor of San Antonio, a position which catapulted him to national prominence as the cabinet secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development under President Bill Clinton. He's also served as COO and president of Univision Television Network. He is currently a partner in a minority-owned investment banking firm. Welcome, Henry Cisneros. It's great to have Hello. you. Yolanda, wonderful to be with you, to uh, see you in action once again. Uh, you haven't lost your touch and uh, always always uh, insightfully uh, laying out ideas that are useful to other people. So I look forward to spending the next half hour with you. Well, this is a wonderful opportunity. It's a perfect timing because so much has uh, come together in, in recent weeks. Uh, it's been a very challenging time. But I want to go back to your uh, your beginnings, your your work, and your your what has driven you all these years. You've had an extraordinary trajectory of achievement, of course, across mm -hmm. decades of your life. Uh, you've served in so many different capacities, uh, elected official offices and and cabinet positions, and 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 heading a, a television network, uh, and it goes on and on. What has been your driving force? Well, that's a, a really good question, and I don't know whether I've ever been asked it quite that way. I, I guess when I look back at the th principal themes in my life, uh, they both have an association with sort of family origins. Uh, one of those themes is a deep sense of service to the country, which stems from my father's service in World War II, and having grown up in a household, uh, essentially uh, sort of military values, uh, but also... Uh, 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 surrounded by family members who all were dedicated to trying to move the country forward, belief in the country, love for this country, uh, flaws and all, uh, but a deep sense of our mission is to try to make it better. And then the second theme has always been the fact that I'm a Latino living in a neighborhood that is uh, called the poorest neighborhood in San Antonio, that's where I grew up, that's where I live today. So the combination of wanting to help the country go forward, but seeing the opportunity to open it up and make it work for everybody, those who've been marginalized, those who've been poor, uh, bring them into the mainstream. So even though my jobs have been at different places in the American hierarchy, a mayor, a cabinet officer, a business person with an office in the Chrysler Building in New York, um, uh, I, 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 those, those twin themes are, are what drives me. Really, well, really powerful driving forces. Yeah, they are. They are. And, uh, you know, there's also, I suppose, a, a dimension of sort of religious belief, spiritual belief. I, I operate from the premise that God put us on this earth to make it better because we were here. Mm -hmm. And, um, he didn't say, do it when it's convenient, do it when it's easy. He said, that's what I expect of you. And uh, so that that makes for a fairly, uh, you know, determined, <laughs> constant uh, work program uh, for, uh, out of a lifetime. And I'm, I'm just fortunate to have been healthy and energetic enough to, to work at it. Well, you have extraordinary discipline because apart from all of your uh, professional and other achievements, political achievements, you've also authored 14 books. That takes a tremendous amount of discipline. Well, as you know, you would know because you've authored books yourself, how much uh, work is involved. But I've not all of those are books that I've authored by myself. Frequently, I've edited collections of um, uh, collaboration with with other people, for example, I did a, a book on um, uh, the Latino, the praise of Latinos in the nation's future, Latinos in the nation's future, and that was a collection of about twelve or so colleagues that I'd worked with over the years, who had thoughts about education and about housing and about uh, community building and so forth. Um, also edited a book on uh, the aging of 
the country's population and particularly that aspect that is so important in their lives, which is housing. So I've, I've edited a couple of books that were an attempt to sort of put ideas on the table that are forward looking. And then I've had a couple that I wrote myself. So, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a way to take ideas and make them available to other people. And that it seems to me is the virtue of it. Well, speaking of housing, when you were the head of housing and urban development cabinet secretary, you were credited with creating the highest level of home ownership in the nation's history. Today, it's very, very different. And I remember that you were instrumental in, in, in helping bring about a housing development for disabled people in East Los Angeles in Gloria Molina's Superficial District. And I was involved in that as well. And uh, those kinds of projects are highly important. But today, young people are, are saying they can't afford, they can barely afford the rent, much yeah. less about buying a home. You know, I remember the day as HUD secretary when the assistant secretary in charge of FHA housing uh, came in to see me and he said, look, we've just done an economic analysis of the economy for the rest of the 1990s. This was about 1994 or so. And the president had made some decisions that seemed to put in place a good interest rate climate for the rest of the 90s and the potential for growth. A decade which turned out to be one of the strongest periods of growth in American history as it worked out, in part fed, in part fed, fed by the tech explosion. But what he said was, we think that um, as a result of this strong economy, it may be possible to achieve the highest home ownership rate this country has ever achieved. We can actually move forward on that goal. At the time, the home ownership rate was about 62%. Back in the 1960s, it had been 66%. So that was the gold, go from 62 to around 66. And also the Latino and African-American home ownership rate was around 42%, well below the average. And the white home ownership at that point was something just under 70. So we put a program together to really drive home ownership, which is so critical to creating the American middle class. We know now that for most Americans, the sum total of their net worth, what they own, what they actually can say, this I own, not just wages, not just salary, but ownership is a home. And there, it's important because then once you own a home and you have equity, you can cash that in to send a young person to college or to create a small business, any number of options. So it's it's wealth. It's 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 the difference between income, which is outflow, if you will, inflow and outflow, versus wealth, something you actually can call net worth. And housing is critical to that. So we went to work trying to increase the home ownership rate. And at the end of the of the of the of the decade of the 90s, we had indeed achieved the highest home ownership rate in American history. And the Latino and African American home ownership went from 42 to right at 50%, right at 50%, still much lower than others, but a dramatic increase. Um, it is true that things are very different today because we went through a great recession and a lot of people lost their homes. It's also true that um, the pandemic has been damaging and changed the trajectory of home ownership. But today, unfortunately, housing is a, we're, we're going through a housing crisis. There's not one major city in America where a family earning the minimum wage can afford the rent on a two bedroom apartment. In Austin last year, rents went up 40%, 40% increase in rent on people who were renting. So that just contributes to the eviction rate and it contributes to instability in housing. Uh, and then not enough is being produced. So the demand is outstripping the supply, further driving up the price. And the same is true for entry level home ownership. We know now that many young professionals are not going to be able to enjoy the life their parents did with respect to housing and therefore with respect to wealth because they are locked out of the entry-level house. There's just not enough of them and the price is too high. 
So this is a serious problem for the country, and it's much more than just bricks and mortar and 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 a house and the pride of having a house. It's the mechanism by which we create wealth and a middle class. And that's very important. It's it's uh, greed seems to be a factor. The Me Too uh, philosophy that has proliferated uh, since 2015. Uh, that is hopefully going to shift back to some kind of normal, if we can expect that. Uh, but we have to have those opportunities available for people. and Absolutely. To create, to create uh, a, a equitability of distribution. Yeah. I saw a study done by a group called the Demos Institute in New York that chron it was called um, Sustaining the Middle. Mm -hmm. And it was about how we achieved a middle class in the years after World War II. And this study concluded there were three factors. One of them was the GI Bill, which made it possible to get people to get an education. Troops came back from the war, they got college degrees, and all of that contributed to the technological advances of the 60s and 70s. Secondly, minimum wage. We had strong minimum wage and labor protections. So we were able to lift people out of poverty onto the ladder that began their climb to the middle class. And thirdly was home ownership and the equity that it allows people to build up. That was a fantastic period for America. You might even say, you know, the strongest, most robust growth, growth in, in, in our American middle class. Now we're seeing the hollowing out of the middle class. Um, but we know some of the things that have to be done. We just haven't managed the political will to actually do them. Well, we've just had an election which uh, many feel has uh, uh, managed to preserve democracy and we should be able to get more of these initiatives uh, through uh, through Congress and through the Senate. Do you think there is a pathway back to some kind of uh, sustainability and uh, supportability for uh, growth of middle class people that includes everybody? I do. I, I'm, I'm optimistic and it, hopefully it's not a false optimism, but I have found in my life that, you know, one of the, the great differentiators between leaders and the great differentiators between people actually is the degree of, of optimism. You, do you wake up in the morning and the glass is half empty and you approach the day with, with, with the negativism that that engenders, or do you approach the day with a glass that's half full, as Yolanda, you do better than almost anybody that I know. Uh, and whatever obstacles, whatever barriers, you're just determined to overcome them. It is a given that you're going to try to overcome them. Maybe not always a, a successful, but you're going to try to overcome them. Well, so, I like the idea of uh, the glass is refillable. <laughs> that too, <laughs> that too, that too. So, um, I do believe that uh, out of this closeness of the election, uh, on the important things that are before the country, we're going to find, and I, I'm predicting this, that the middle of both parties will understand they're a working majority if they choose to be. If they leave the craziness on the sides, the extremes, uh, maybe listen to them, they may have a point to make uh, uh, that's valid, but 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 the, the the common sense core, the middle, can get some things done that need to be done. For example, right now we're facing the issue of the debt limit, uh, which has to be passed in order for the country to be able to maintain its credit rating and so forth. The war in Ukraine, Lord knows we need to stand with Ukraine and not be party to watching them fall under the, the boot of Russian uh, uh, aggression. Uh, and and so many other things that need to be done, like the housing we were just talking about. I, I have to believe there is a middle there that's big enough to answer the call from the American people in this election, which is, guys, put the craziness aside. Let's get done things that need to be done. I believe that. Well, this we hope so. You've had ex uh, experience also in media as the head of the uh, Univision Television Network. And I'm wondering what your take is on why the perception, we've had so much negative uh, vitriol and hate talk against, you know, 
Mexicanos, Latinos in this country since 2015, and we're still suffering from it. Why is it that the media and the uh, the powers that be do not see that Latinos and immigrants are a vital contribution to this nation's economy? We are a two point seven trillion dollar market economic force uh, soon to surpass the economy of France. Why aren't we seen as the uh, the contributing people that we are? Well, first of all, let me agree with you that that's who we are. Mm -hmm. um, we are a very hardworking, dedicated people looking to the future, uh, willing to sacrifice today so that our children can do better, uh, deep devotion, spiritual devotion, commitment to families. Those are sort of the, the basic American values that in many instances have been eroded uh, or 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 uh, uh, we, we face populations that are just tired of the striving. And yet here's a population that's hungry, fresh, young, ambitious, and strivers. So I think it's a, I've said many times uh, what America doesn't, realize is that the Latinos among us are a key to a vibrant American future. They absolutely are. It's the nature of immigration. It's the nature of, of refreshment with young populations, people who still believe in the American dream, even though others have said, it, you know, it, it doesn't exist. Our best, best days are behind us. These are people who can't afford to believe that because they're staking their whole lives and their children's lives on the American future, and they're willing to do their part to make it come through. Why don't Americans understand it? I don't know, but I suspect it has to do with being blinded by some ancient prejudices or people get can't get past the fact that people have different skin color or different last names or different accents or can't, can't get over it when you know, it's so patently clear that they bring, these Latinos bring the essential dynamics, ingredients, energy, force that, that the country needs. An infusion of that Latino culture would be a great thing for America. Well, that's all, and it's all in the free holders. Those are the things that we bring it, into this country. Exactly, exactly. Something that's so an, simple. Something. That's a nice, subtle plug for your last book. <laughs> no, that's the first, your first book. Your first book. Your first book. But you're you're in that first book. You're one of the wonderful contributors to that book. Mm -hmm. And and I remember the story about your uh, grandfather, uh, Romolo, and the uh, mm -hmm. the passion for uh, contribution and service and community yeah. and, yeah. and patriotism that, uh, and you know, it, that he mm -hmm. provided you with. And, yeah. and this is what's so important in the country. That's why I have, I really flummoxed by this, this yeah. uh, re resistance to who we are and what we do. Well, you'll be proud to know, Yolanda, that at this very moment, I'm sitting in my office in the building that my grandfather built as a print oh. shop in oh. 1949. Um, and it's uh, solid as a rock, uh, built strong as a bomb shelter. <laughs> uh, and we've enhanced it. And when the printing shop played out he died at 93 uh, he had come to to, to to work on a friday went to the doctor on a saturday and died on a sunday at 93 so he worked until the last friday afternoon that he possibly could <laughs> but he had built this wonderful print shop that was one of the largest union print shops in san antonio and when the family well when printing changed and people were no longer going to print shops to get wedding invitations and school graduation announcements and school football programs. Uh, the building became empty and I helped the family uh, bail it out of, of tax obligations and converted it into a, a modern office building. Uh, and that's where I'm sitting right this minute in the, surrounded by the blood, sweat and tears that my grandfather and and uncles put into this place. That's beautiful. Well, you had a lot of blood, sweat, and tears across the decades of your life, and now with the, you have a new book out, uh, the Texas Triangle. Talk yeah. about that. Well, it, it really it's a it's something that that fascinated me 
way back when, even in the years that I was mayor in the 1980s, that it was clear to me that San Antonio was linked to, the future of San Antonio was linked to this really fortuitous development that we've got, which is one of the more dynamic urban complexes in the world. And I use the words advisedly, in the world. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth in the north of the, of the triangle, Houston in the southeast corner of the triangle, and San Antonio and Austin in the uh, southeast corner of the triangle, or rather southwest corner of the triangle. So you have Houston, number four in population in the country, San Antonio, number seven in population in the country, Dallas, number nine, uh, nine ranked city in the country, and Austin, number 10, four cities ranked among the 10 most populous in America in this geographic triangle, sort of feeding off of each other, trading with each other, sharing resources. Uh, it's a pretty powerful, I think, piece of geography for the future of America. And, and I think it's gonna be notable in the world. And how will that play into the, you've, you've done so much advocacy work for Latinos and immigrant population, yeah. because we are the drivers. We couldn't yeah. have worked through COVID without those frontline people that were putting well, food on our table and the truckers and everything else. Well, that's a good question. Um, the core of all of those areas that I just described is increasingly Latino. Mm -hmm. And it is becoming the dominant population, those cities are, in Texas. So when you ask me, how is this going to work out? Well, it's going to work out for the people because they're going to be riding the rocket ship of some pretty dynamic economies. So there's going to be some fortunes made. There's going to be some small businesses created that grow into large businesses. And there's going to be lots of jobs and encouragement for younger people to get an education so they can be part of that dynamic. So it works for us. And I think what it will mean for Texas is that what we have once thought of as the land of ranches and oil wells and wide open spaces is going to be one of the more dynamic urban complexes in the world. And Latinos are going to be in position to ride that rocket ship. Um, and so it, 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 it feeds kind of the best model that I like, that I hope for, for our country, which is what I always believed when I was mayor and what I used to share with President Clinton, uh, a two-fisted approach. One, we do the hard-headed things necessary to keep our economy growing, creating opportunity. Do what we need to do in terms of infrastructure and water and power and, 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 and roads and mobility and, and all of those. But the other fist in its two-fisted effort hits with equal impact, and that is education, training, more inclusive and open strategies, et cetera. And that, that, that's kind of been the American model. We haven't done enough on the latter, on the training, on the education in this new era. The new skills necessary in the computer age, for example, the, the, the kind of computer literacy that's needed and digging deep into populations and finding people who have given up and bringing them back into the workforce and, and, and dealing with the, 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 the population of people who are older, for example. We have this aging tsunami where people need more help and assistance. So I think we're looking at the potential to put in place some models that can serve the whole country. It's important to do that. A few months back, I interviewed uh, Herman Gallegos, who at 91 is still going strong and was one of the founders of Hispanics and Philanthropy. You've I, remember, I remember Herman well. You've served on a number of uh, corporate and foundation boards and nonprofit boards. How do we get the foundations to bring more Latinos into the mix? Because we're getting, we're receiving as an overall group, less than 4% of all the resources that foundations have, and they have gazillions of dollars. And if those could be put into education and infrastructure in these other areas to create uh, new productivity and new opportunity and new educational opportunities to move up the ladder, that would be a fantastic solution. Well, that's a huge uh, oversight uh, presently in our country. And uh, it goes back to your earlier point about how can Americans not understand and comprehend the treasure that, that we have in this Latino population that wants to contribute and wants to grow and, and everything would work to enhance the American 
economy and American progress. Uh, but you're right, our foundations are not doing enough. Many of them are still sort of in an older model, which is a strictly black white dichotomy in the American system, as opposed to something more multicultural as a reality and, and dealing with it. Uh, so we're a little bit behind the times in terms of recognizing. I mean, the first order of business was to recognize inequity in our society. And it's appropriate that we focused on sort of the black-white dichotomy. It was the most severe and, and the clearest. But we're now into a more complex reality of a mix of Im immigrant mixes that, that, that unless we want to create a new permanent underclass, we, ha we have to, 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 to recognize and deal with. Uh, that means people on boards of foundations and staffing of foundations. It means people on uh, running some of the nation's largest nonprofit. It's happening. It's happening steadily. Um, but 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 I think as a community, the Latino community needs to make sure to uh, you know keep the focus and keep the impetus. Which you know your people like you are, and your observations and your encouragement are invaluable. Um, and you've always you've always had those instincts, but I think what makes them particularly powerful now is, you know, given your state of life, you have a chance to to really state them with power, the power of experience, the power of conviction. And thank you for doing that. Well, it is a pleasure to do that. And it's been wonderful to have you here with us. And I, I want to see so much more in terms of how we connect all of these dots so that we can have more engagement at the foundation level, more uh, education in terms of history and awareness of the importance of our contributions throughout the country, Southwest in particular, but now throughout the Southeast and all the way up to, you know, Maine and, uh, and North. Yeah. Uh, that we, we do have a great deal to offer and we have to get out of this kind of uh, East Coast beltway mentality. It doesn't know a clue about the fact that Spanish were in the Americas for a hundred years before the Jamestown. Yeah, well, I, I remember the days when you had responsibility, cultural responsibilities in New Mexico, which is in some sense, a kind of a laboratory of multiculturalism. Uh, it's, it's, it's so in the DNA of the state uh, and and good things can be done to create a sense of pride and 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 self knowledge and 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 determination forward. Um, and you know, New Mexico is a smaller state, so it's possible to really do some powerful things there. But then the trick is to export them and replicate them on a larger scale in a lot of other settings. So I, if you could imagine, you know, the lessons that you were extending in New Mexico being applied in the 800,000 student Los Angeles school system, for example. That's that's the task before us. Well, we have a lot of good things that are that are coming around the bend. In California, there was a measure passed last year and two years ago goes into effect uh, be, to be implemented to have ethnic, require ethnic studies as a as a requirement for graduation from high school. And that's I think it's help I think that's just I think that's just common sense and smart. You know, everybody needs to have an understanding of the realities with which we work, and they are the new realities. Um, so I, I remember going years and years ago to speak at the invitation of a university in in um, Minnesota. Uh, I think it was Mankato State, and I uh, said to the students and to the faculty. You know, you would do well to understand the dynamic that exists in the rest of the country. That area of Minnesota is one of the the least heterogeneous areas of the state. Very, very homogeneous. And I said to them, because you're gonna you're gonna go from here to get a job in Chicago, and you're not gonna recognize, mm -hmm. you know, the, the reality of what you work with in terms of your coworkers, the people who you supervise, the people who have positions a, a, above you. Uh, if you're if you're not learning these things as part of your education even now, yeah. and you you've more recently become involved. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, we have come involved in investment banking. You're part of an investment uh, minority owned investment banking firm. How does that play into what needs to happen economically for our people? 
Well, for a good 20 years, I've been involved in raising institutional capital uh, for urban needs. Uh, the first company that we founded in Los Angeles was um, dedicated to building housing, workforce housing, not upscale, not uh, subsidized, but for working people. Uh, and we've had a good run with that company. Uh, I've also worked in public finance, raising capital for municipal projects, uh, uh, all kinds of water, power, airport, uh, and, and other things in the municipal sphere. And now raising capital with our latest company and funds to deploy into needed infrastructure. So literally today is a big day because we are closing on a almost $400 million investment in terminals six and seven at JFK airport in New York. So it's taught me a good deal about uh, the capital markets of the United States, how they work and how we can deploy them for good. And obviously that is a critical area for minorities, people of color to be involved because uh, we all know it's it, those are the markets that, 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 that make the economy work. And it's the last frontier for inclusion. Uh, so many other sectors of American life uh, have worked at trying to be inclusive, but the money markets don't think that way, don't work that way. I've been very fortunate to, to be working with minority folks in minority owned companies striving to establish their place in the world of capital investment, debt, financial uh, realities. And I'm proud to say, I think we're beginning to make some progress, but but only slowly and small. There's much more to do. But that's in the rubric along the route of where the country needs to be going. And we're trying and going in the right direction. Yolanda, it's wonderful to spend time with you as always. And I want to thank you for uh, this project that you're involved in, talking to people, trying to understand their realities. And also, as you do so well, and you said, connect the dots, find the patterns, understand what this all means, and can't wait to see what the, uh, the, the fabric you weave out of this will look like. Well, Henry Cisnetto, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining me on Yolanda Nava. Do you see what I see? And to the audience, I would love to say, uh, just urge you to pick up copies of Through the Dark, and it's all in the frijoles that we mentioned earlier in the uh, interview uh, during your holiday gift giving. It's our powerful uh, culture and inspirational uh, stories and uh, life-changing uh opportunities and teachings that are very important. And Yolanda, next month, yes. please know that we need your voice. There's no other voice like it because no one has had the experience that you've had or demonstrated the courage that you have. And when I, I mean, there's a lot of people who've demonstrated great courage, but, but yours has been of its own variety and impressively powerful. So please never, never stop thinking and sharing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Henry, very much. And be sure and tune in next month to our December edition of Yolanda Nava, Do You See What I See? We'll be joined by documentarian, director, and author Jesus Trevino. Tune in next time. See you then.